live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. While the NFL draft is unpredictable by nature, one thing that just about every team knows beforehand is what their needs are. It's not like your needs change too much during the draft in terms of adding new needs. Yes, you remove needs by drafting certain positions. The Jaguars needed a quarterback entering the 2021 NFL Draft, and after drafting Trevor Lawrence, they no longer needed a quarterback. But very rarely are you going to add needs during the draft. As in, a team that didn't need a quarterback entering the draft now desperately needs one when they're on the clock. You know your positional strengths and weaknesses going into this marathon of sorts, and know what positions you need to find starters at, what positions you need depth at, and what positions you're set at and don't need to take unless you can find some extreme value. And that's the case for 99.9% .9 of the time. It's tough to necessarily get worse during the draft. But in 1980, the St. Louis Cardinals were panicking entering the draft. I talked about the San Francisco 49ers in 1989 panic picking a tight end after their starting tight end, John Frank, retired on the day of the draft. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, at least with that, and as awful as the timing was, the Niners had some indication throughout the offseason that he was retiring. The Cardinals, on the other hand, thought they had their tight end of the future locked up, and that he was going to be the clear-cut starter for years to come. Instead, they miss out on him and lose him, not even 24 hours before draft day. And this is the story behind the craziest pre-draft controversy in the over-century-long history of the Cardinals franchise. Before I talk about the actual trade in question and how it failed so badly, we need some context to understand what exactly the Cardinals needed, and how big their need at the tight end position was. There were many reasons why the St. Louis Cardinals were not a good football team in 1979, and this video would probably be three hours long if I listed every single reason, from tensions between the front office and the coaching staff regarding who should play a quarterback, which got so heated that Bud Wilkinson was fired after 13 games because of it, to a defense that could not rush the passer, picking up just 28 sacks in 16 games and having just one player, Bob Pollard, record more than four sacks, to a kicking game that was willful and resulted in the Cardinals hitting just 46.2% of their field goals to just about everything else. But one of the big reasons was the fact that they just flat out did not have a tight end. For years, the Cardinals had one of the best tight ends in the history of football in Jackie Smith, but the years spent trying to find his replacement were lean. And by this point in 1979, it's almost like tight end was a complete afterthought. By the end of the season, the Cardinals had three tight ends on their roster. The man you've been watching this whole time was their number one guy, a man in his seventh season in the NFL by the name of Gary Paris. He finished the season with 14 receptions for 174 yards and no touchdowns. Again, this was their number one tight end, and he was kept out of the end zone all season. For some perspective on how bad he was, amongst all tight ends in football, he ranked 28th in receiving yards in a 2018 league. The Pittsburgh Steelers' backup tight end, Randy Grossman, had more receiving yards by the end of the year than Gary Paris, the starting tight end on the Cardinals. And it's not like the backups were much better. Their other three tight ends on the roster by the end of the season were Richard Osborne, a fourth-year player originally drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles in the ninth round of the 1976 NFL Draft, and Bill Morrell, a rookie who was drafted by the Steelers but never played a game with the team before arriving on the Cardinals. Osborne finished the season with 37 yards and no touchdowns, while Morrell finished the season with two catches for 20 yards and no touchdowns. In total, the three tight ends on the roster by the end of the season combined for 23 catches for 231 yards and no touchdowns. Obviously, that production is terrible. Now, in fairness to the Cardinals, the fact that they were this bad at tight end was somewhat out of their control. Their number one tight end going into training camp was J.V. Kane who was a fairly solid player and was one of Jim Hart's go-to targets. However, on July 22, 1979, he tragically died during training camp due to heart failure. Today, his number 88 jersey is retired by the Cardinals, having never been worn again in honor of him. It was a horrible tragedy that, obviously off the field, resulted in the loss of human life, as dying at 28 years old, and on your birthday nonetheless, is awful, and is a man who has gone far too soon. But on the field, even though it feels wrong to talk about a game after a man just died, and there's no easy way to transition, it resulted in the Cardinals having a giant hole at the tight end position that they were unable to fill in time for the season, and the result showed. 
If you combine every single tight end to play for the Cardinals and put their stats together to form one super tight end, that tight end would have ranked 25th in the NFL in receiving yards amongst all tight ends. For some more perspective on just how inept they were at this position, if New Orleans Saints tight end Henry Childs only played between weeks 12 and 13 that season, and just decided to take every other week of the season off, he still would have finished the season with more yards than every single tight end on the Cardinals by the end of the year combined. Dave Stutter, a right tackle for the Denver Broncos, had more receiving touchdowns than every remaining tight end on the Cardinals combined. I think you get the picture. When it came to the tight end position for the Cardinals, you might as well call them Olivia Rodrigo, because God, it was brutal out here. It was clear that the Cardinals were going to compete in 1980 like they had done in the mid-70s, especially in a very tough division in the NFC East, that they were going to need to upgrade this position badly, and actually get a tight end that could help the offense out in the passing and the running game, and could be a guy that defenses actually have to game plan against. And before the draft, the Cardinals found their guy, because they were able to work out a trade that in their eyes was going to fix this problem for good. And for this, the Cards decided that the solution to their problem was right within their own state in Missouri. This is Walter White, and in the eyes of the St. Louis Cardinals, this was going to be the man to fix their problem at the tight end position. Throughout the middle of the 1970s, White was one of the better tight ends in the NFL, and definitely one of the most underrated. He was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers in the third round of the 1975 NFL Draft, but never found his way onto the team, and eventually made it onto the Kansas City Chiefs. And White turned out to be an exceptionally good player for Kansas City. In his second season in the league in 1976, he had 47 receptions for 808 yards and 7 touchdowns. The 808 receiving yards were the most of any player on the team, and the 7 receiving touchdowns were more than double the next closest of any player on the team, as Billy Masters was in second place with 3 touchdowns. In fact, his efforts in 1976 were so good that he finished 7th in the entire NFL in receiving touchdowns and 9th in the entire NFL in receiving yards. And to go even further than that, not only did he finish second amongst all tight ends in receiving touchdowns that year, only behind Oakland Raiders and eventual Hall of Fame tight end Dave Casper, who had 10, and not only did he finish second amongst all tight ends in receptions that year, only behind Casper, who had 53, but he finished first amongst all tight ends in receiving yards, as he blew away the competition. He had 808 yards, and no other tight end had 700. It was always going to be tough with how good the Raiders were that year, as they went 13-1 and, and eventually won their first Super Bowl in franchise history, and with how bad the Chiefs were that year, as they went 5-9 and, and only had one nationally televised game. But you could make a legitimate argument that Walter White deserved first team or second team All-Pro honors that year at tight end. The numbers, the production, and the tape were all there. White followed that up in 1977 with another great season, recording 48 receptions for 674 yards and 5 touchdowns. He led the Chiefs in receptions by having 50% more catches than second place on the team. He led the Chiefs in receiving yards by being the only player on the team to have at least 500 yards. And he led the Chiefs in receiving touchdowns by being one of just two players to score multiple receiving touchdowns on the season, alongside Henry Marshall, who had four. White finished ninth in the entire NFL in receptions, and actually finished tied with Dave Casper for the most receptions by a tight end, as White and Casper were the only two who had crossed the 40 catch mark. And on top of that, his 674 receiving yards, once again, led the league amongst all tight ends. In two of his first three seasons in the NFL, White was the league leader in his position in receiving yards. That is a heck of a start to your career, and even though the yardage and touchdown numbers dipped a bit in 1978, thanks to Marv Levy coming in as the head coach, and taking the game back to the 1940s by installing the wing tee offense, he still had his third straight year with over 40 catches, as he ended the year with 42. From 1976 to 78, White had 137 receptions. The only tight end in football to have more catches in that three-year stretch? Take a wild guess. Of course, it was Dave Casper, who had 163. You get the picture, though. White was a great player, and any time you're a young tight end, and you can legitimately be put in the conversation with a legendary Dave Casper, you know you're doing something right. But just days before the 1980 NFL Draft, the Cardinals and Chiefs worked out a deal where the Cardinals would acquire the soon-to-be 29-year-old tight end and would give up a third-round pick in return, which in this case would be pick number 60. Now, you might be asking yourself a very valid question. Why the heck did the Chiefs trade Walter White in the first place if he was that good? And the answer to that question is, well, I'm not entirely sure. 
There were never any reports about him being disgruntled or wanting out. There were never any conflicts between he and the coaching staff or the front office. And the Chiefs were just about the only team in the NFL that could realistically compete with the Cardinals for the title of the worst tight end unit in football, as their starting tight end for the season was Tony Samuels, who finished there with 14 receptions for 147 yards and no touchdowns. And their other tight ends were pretty bad too. Al Dixon was acquired midway through the 1979 season from the New York Giants, but didn't have a catch with the Chiefs that season, and Ed Beckman had three career catches in three seasons and no career touchdowns. As bad as the Cardinals were a tight end, at least Harris had five career touchdowns. No player on the Chiefs that was a tight end on the active roster by the end of the 1979 season ever found the end zone. The trade was considered by many publications to be a surprising development, and there weren't a whole lot of reasons for it, so I guess we can just assume that the Chiefs thought that a third round pick was a good deal for him. It seemed like this was a done deal. Understandably, the Cardinals were thrilled about this move. Head coach Jim Hannafan loved White so much, in fact, that he went on to compare him with Jackie Smith and J.V. Kane. He was willing to compare Walter White to the five-time Pro Bowler who played 15 seasons with the Cardinals and finished his career with the team with 7,918 receiving yards, which was the all-time record in franchise history. And the team was so excited about the news that after the trade, both head coach Jim Hannafan and quarterback Jim Hart called White up to welcome him to the Cardinals. Yes, the trade wasn't official yet, as he still had to pass his physical, which was critical after missing most of the 1979 season following an infamous injury against the Houston Oilers where he suffered a knee injury and got surgery after colliding with a piece of television equipment during the game. However, neither side viewed this as a concern, so all that had to happen was White had to show up in St. Louis and everything would be good to go. Just show up and the Cardinals tight end problem is officially solved once and for all. Well, remember what I said about comparing Walter White to Dave Casper? There's another way that the two men are similar. You see, Dave Casper's nickname was The Ghost, going off of Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's where the iconic play nickname Ghost of the Post comes from, where Casper scored the game-winning touchdown from 10 yards out in double overtime of the 1977 divisional round against the Baltimore Colts, which was the first touchdown ever scored in double overtime in NFL history. It's still remembered today as one of the most iconic plays of all time. And Walter White's nickname after this was also The Ghost, because he just decided to be completely invisible and not even show up or report. The Cardinals sent White flight information for a flight on Friday, April 25th, which was the day the trade was finalized. He didn't make the flight. No worries, the Cards sent him information for another flight on Monday, April 28th. And once again, he just refused to get on the plane. He did not want to get traded, and basically refused to play for the Cardinals. There was never a reason given for why White just did this completely out of nowhere. There were no publicized conflicts between he and the organization or he and Coach Hannafin. White just refused to report. Bob Spranger, who controlled public relations for the Chiefs, delivered the closest thing to an explanation that we know, saying, Walter was disappointed from the first time he heard about the trade. He seemed surprised that he was dealt. I'm sure he thought about something like this, but I don't think he ever realized that it really might happen. But just like that, the deal was off. Joe Sullivan, the vice president of operations for the Cardinals, said on the deal falling apart, as stated in the original agreement, the trade was based on White completing and passing a physical examination by the Cardinals before Monday. But White unfortunately failed to report to St. Louis for his physical, and both teams agreed to cancel the trade. This seemed like a massive blow to the Cardinals on paper. They thought that Walter White was going to fix their tight end problem, and that they wouldn't need to draft a tight end early. They thought that they could use their early picks to address one of the many needs that the team had. And now, they not only found out that the trade was off, and their plans had to be adjusted, but that the trade was called off not even 24 hours before the draft. On Monday morning, the Cardinals thought they had their tight end of the future. On Monday night, completely out of nowhere, they had less than 24 hours to come up with a plan to fix this before Tuesday's draft. But the truly amazing part about this story is that even though the situation was incredibly chaotic and was a giant mess in every sense of the word, everything worked out just fine for St. Louis at the end of the day. Sometimes, the best thing that can happen to a team is that the trade gets cancelled, because the alternative worked out so much better. We famously saw that in 1990 with the Dallas Cowboys, where they had a deal in place to trade up in the NFL Draft and select Baylor linebacker James Francis, only for that trade to fall through when the Cincinnati Bengals took him one spot before the Cowboys trade partner got on the clock. It forced the Cowboys to settle for some running back named Emmett Smith 
who only went on to be a part of one of the NFL's greatest dynasties and set the all-time rushing yardage record. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And even though this incident in 1980 is obviously not as well known or highly remembered as that, this was another one of those instances where the fact that the deal fell through, even though it felt like the Cardinals lost the battle, they wound up winning the war because of it. In the first round, to the credit of the Cardinals and the men drafting, unlike the 49ers in 1989 where they selected Wesley Walls in a panic pick because of their sudden need a tight end and had a backfire on them miserably, they did not panic pick and did not take a tight end in the first round. They easily could have abandoned their plans because of this shocking incident with Walter White and decided to go tight end right away, taking Nebraska tight end Junior Miller, who was regarded as the number one tight end of the class and who wound up going one spot afterwards to the Atlanta Falcons at pick number seven. However, they decided not to do that and instead stuck to their guns and stuck to the board and took Michigan defensive end Curtis Greer at pick number six. Cardinals head coach Jim Hannafin said that the debate between taking Greer and taking a tight end in light of the Walter White news was a debate that lasted about one second, saying, There's no doubt this was the guy we wanted. As a side note, to learn more about the coaching career of Jim Hannafin, click the card in the upper right corner. And also, to the credit of the Cardinals, this pick worked out incredibly well for them, as Greer finished his career with 69 and a half sacks, including three seasons with over 12 sacks, and an incredible 1983 season where he had 16 sacks, only trailing Mark Gastineau of the New York Jets and Fred Dean of the San Francisco 49ers for the NFL League. By the time his career ended, Greer's total of 69 and a half sacks for the Cardinals ranked first all time, and was a record that stood all the way until 2021, when Chandler Jones broke it, as Jones finished his Cardinals career with 71 and a half sacks. Safe to say, the Cards made the right call here with not panicking and by sticking to the game plan, even after being thrown this curveball completely out of nowhere. But they still needed a tight end. There was no getting around that. And when the second round came, they decided that now was the time to address the position. With that, they went back to Ann Arbor, just like they did with Greer, and took Michigan tight end Doug Marsh, who was coming off of a great season with the Wolverines, where he finished fourth in the conference in receiving yards with 612, and fourth in yards per catch with 18 and a half. He was also the leading receiver on the Wolverines in receptions that year with 33, when no other player even had 20, and was the only player on the team to eclipse 500 receiving yards. He was very good. The Cardinals were really high on Marsh, with Director of Operations Joe Sullivan saying on him, he catches the ball real well, and he'll give us a reliable blocking performance. He has a natural pop when he hits, he blocks down real well, and he contains the linebacker on sweeps. But we felt the big thing was his ability to get deep. He has excellent speed. And as it turned out, Sullivan and the Cardinals were right, because Marsh was a pretty good player in the NFL, to the point where when all was said and done, amongst every tight end to get drafted in 1980, he was the best of them all. He was first in receptions, first in receiving yards, and first in receiving touchdowns. Only four players, period, had more receiving touchdowns than he did, all of whom were wide receivers. So that's pretty good. He played seven seasons with the Cardinals, finishing his career with 167 receptions for 2,140 yards and 19 touchdowns. He had a 1983 season where he recorded eight receiving touchdowns, which was tied for seventh in the entire NFL. And he had a 1984 season where he had a career-high 608 receiving yards being just one of four tight ends of the entire NFC that year to eclipse 600 yards. Oddly enough, all four of them were in the NFC East. Oh, and Walter White? He never played in the NFL again after that trade fell through, even though the Chiefs tried to trade him immediately after that trade fell through to the Los Angeles Rams for a sixth round pick in 1980 and a third round pick in 1981. So the point easily goes to the Cardinals for this one. Everything worked out pretty well for St. Louis in the end, as they did a great job of not panicking even in the face of adversity and even though they had every opportunity to do so. Now, is this situation in a vacuum all that crazy? Not entirely. I mean, we've seen trades go through only to get canceled many times before due to a failed physical. John Dornbus getting traded from Philadelphia to New Orleans, Eric Dickerson getting traded from Atlanta to Green Bay. I could go on and on. But the way that this one happened was absolutely chaotic to say the least. For the player to not even show up, and for the trade to fall through not even 24 hours before the Cardinals were set to be on the clock, is another level of chaos that I'm not sure we've seen with a trade like this before. But it obviously worked out for the Cardinals in the end, because they came out on top with a pretty good tight end that they probably would not have drafted if they took a chance on Walter White. Even though they were upset at the time that the Walter White deal fell through, and even though the Cardinals could have easily broken bad, it's safe to say that the Cardinals were victorious at the end of the day. 
Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.